Well, sort of like being home, looking back at all these faces that are looking at us now. We, uh, we're glad to be here. I just want to let you know that uh, we started a work in Vincennes, Indiana from scratch in 2019. And so uh, my family went from being fully supported in one place to having no local support um, in one place and all the support coming from outside sources, both congregations and, and individuals. And I want to applaud Adam and Aaron because they help us in our support. We really appreciate that. And so if we ever do take the time to get away for a few days, we like to visit places that support us or folks that support us. And so we're glad to be here. I'm glad to be able to spend a few moments in uh, study of God's word with you. Open your Bibles to the book of Proverbs 4 and verse number 23. We'll start there in a few moments. Proverbs 4 and verse number 23. For many various reasons and uh, different folks in my sphere of life, the issue of heart, uh, heart issues have come up. And, and so it got me to do some thinking about uh, looking at some statistics about heart disease. Did you know that heart disease is the leading cause of death for both ladies and gentlemen. And I was surprised to find out that every 34 seconds, somebody in the United States of America passes away from some type of connection to heart disease. And that spurred my thoughts into what causes heart disease. And I know that most of us know that there's some genes involved in this and some other forms of that. But the two leading causes of heart disease are unhealthy diet and physical inactivity. Unhealthy diet and physical inactivity. And so it stands to reason that any time I feel anything at all is wrong with my physical heart, my blood pumping organ, or you're the same as I do, if I feel anything out of normal at all, I'm immediately going to go to the hospital or call a doctor because we care very much for our physical hearts, for without them we cannot live. And of course, that gets me to thinking about my Bible heart. I cannot live without my Bible heart. You cannot live without your Bible heart. Now, of course, the Bible heart is not the blood pumping organ, is it? It's our minds. It's our, our seat of intelligence. Uh, when the Bible uses the term heart, uh, referring to our spiritual heart, it's talking about our attitudes, our dispositions, the way of life that we live. And so as the verse that you are there at says in Proverbs 4 and verse 23, the old King James says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. I understand other versions will, instead of saying keep, it will say guard your heart. Some will say watch your heart with all diligence. The idea of all diligence is above everything else you do in your life, watch, keep, and guard your Bible heart. I wonder about myself if I am as concerned about my Bible heart as I am about my physical heart. Do you ever wonder the same about yourself? And so just for a few moments this morning, I want to think about some of the kinds of hearts that we need to be in possession of as we go from day to day in our life. And let me remind you, remind you that we talked about this in class with David a few moments ago. You might recall in the book of 1 Samuel 16 and verse number 7 that when God was displeased with King Saul, he set about to look for a new king and he was sent to the house of Jesse. And as all of these uh, sons of Jesse began to be filed in front of the prophet. The prophet said, look at this fellow, Abinadab. He must be the next king's anointed. And we are reminded in 1 Samuel 16 and verse 7 that even though man looks on the outward appearance, the Lord looks where at? The Lord looks on the heart. And so what kind of a heart does the Lord see when he looks at me, when he looks at you? Let me make a few suggestions on what kind of heart we need to have. Let me say first this morning that we need to have a purposed heart. We need to have a purposed heart. You might recall in the New Testament book of 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse number 7, in connection to giving upon the first day of the week, but we use that verse there routinely, but really in giving at all. It says in verse number 7, Every man according as he purposes in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. 
So a purposed heart, by the way, is a heart that plans ahead. That's what the idea of purpose in our heart is. That when we give on the first day of the week here, in a few moments, it's something that we've given prior thought to. You might remember Daniel and Daniel chapter 1 in verse number 8, that great book, that great young man Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the king's meats and wines or, or dainties as some versions like to say. And so a purposed heart is one that, that plans ahead. And let me tell myself as I tell you that if we wait for a situation to arrive in our life and then make a decision on how we're going to handle that, we often make which decision? We often make the wrong decision. And so we need to have purposed hearts, plan ahead to do those things that are right. Let me suggest also that we need to have a pricked heart. You know where you can read about a pricked heart in the Bible, don't you? In the book of Acts chapter 2, and in verse number 37, we have that great sermon preached by Peter and the other apostles. And at the conclusion, we'll say, of the first part of the sermon, we read in verse 37, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart, and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Now I want you to tuck that away and go with me a little further into the book of Acts, to chapter 7 and verse 54, because there we find a similar phrase. They weren't pricked in the heart, but there's a related phrase here in Acts 7, 54, when Stephen was preaching, and what a masterful job he did taking us through the Old Testament. Now when he got down to the end of his lesson, he did refer to them as stiff-necked and uncircumcised in what? In heart and ears. And it says in Acts 7, verse 54, when they heard these things, they were cut to what? They were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on them with their teeth. I suggest today that we need to have hearts that are capable of being pricked. We'll talk about some other hearts later on that touch upon this, but we need to be preaching sermons and, and teaching other folks that in such a way that they, at the end we'll ask, what shall I do? If at the end of your sermons people are asking, what must I do? We're doing something right. We, we have pricked up, we've cut to the heart. But I hope you notice that even though the truth was taught in Acts 2, and the truth was taught in Acts 7, and both of them say something about the heart being cut or the heart being pricked, there were two totally different uh, responses to that, weren't there? And there's going to be today as well. There's going to be some folks today when you teach the truth, the unadulterated truth, they're going to listen to it and they're going to, uh, to hear it and perhaps obey it. But there's going to be a lot of others to that one individual who listens who says, no, thank you, or what in the world are you teaching? And we can't let that upset us. But for our part, I need to make sure I have a heart that still can be pricked with the heart of God, with the word of God. Still cut to the heart by the word of God so that I can be a responsible and obedient person to the Father above. Let's look at some other hearts, though. You might recall in the book of John, chapter 14, one of the most comforting passages in all of the Bible, John 14, verses 1 through 6. For sake of time, we'll not read through all of those verses I will make a reference to verse 1 and also verse number 6. Let me suggest to you also that we need to have an untroubled heart. An untroubled heart. You remember the words of the Lord in John 14 and verse 1? Let not your heart be what? Don't let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And this passage comes to a conclusion in verse 6 by Jesus announcing, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No man comes unto the Father except by me. And as David said in class, I'll say this now. A lot of the things I say, many of the things, all the things I say are to the man in the mirror sometimes that we let stress and worry about the cares of this life overwhelm us to the fact that we do have troubled hearts. But Jesus said what? Don't let your heart be troubled. I wonder why Jesus said that 
Let me give you some reasons why. John 14 and verse number 27. Why should my heart not be troubled? Because the Lord says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives, but as I give. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. God, Lord says, don't let your heart be troubled. I have given you peace. What about John 16? This is a little further on, maybe across the page. John 16, verse 22. And you now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again. And your heart shall rejoice, and your joy, listen carefully, you might highlight this, and your joy no man takes from you. That's wonderful, isn't it? And Jesus, don't let your heart be troubled. Now I understand, as you do, that from day to day there's going to be some upsetting sets of circumstances. There's going to be some things happen that are quote unquote troubling in our life. But by and large and generally speaking, Christians ought to be the happiest people in all the world. We have peace. We have hope. Even the Lord himself said, do not let your heart be troubled. So I encourage you this morning to have an untroubled heart. Release the stress and the worries and all the things that are going on. The Lord says, everything's going to be fine if you walk with me. Isn't that a wonderful thing that the Lord has told us? Now, I want to travel back to the Old Testament book of Job, chapter 23, because in that story of Job, in chapter 23, as Job is going back and forth with his friends, his friends are trying to tell him, you must have done something horrible to deserve the fate that you now find yourself in. And Job keeps saying, I have done nothing at the, for these particular sets of circumstances. Uh, that just goes on back and forth, back and forth. I want you to notice in Job 23, in verse number 16, Job in one of his responses, in this case to Eliphaz, the Timonite, he says, for God makes my heart what? God makes my heart soft. I think it would be good for us to remember that we too need to have soft hearts. Now here is a, a pretty good list of how a soft heart works. A soft heart is teachable. A soft heart is approachable. A soft heart is changeable. A soft heart is a forgiveness seeking heart. The Bible often talks about, we'll not talk about it today in our lesson, but you can do some research on this yourself. Not a soft heart, but a what? But a hard heart. A heart that cannot be penetrated by the word of God, nonetheless, of anybody else's words. That I'm always right, you're always wrong, and there's nothing that can be done about that. Now, if everybody could stand right here in my position, you could say the same thing that I'm about to say that I have made many mistakes in my life. I have done many things that are wrong in my life. I have committed sin in my life like everybody else has. We can get past those if we have what? If we have a soft heart. This is the kind of heart that we pray for as we teach others who are not saved, that as we go through Bible studies with them, we pray that they will have what? A soft heart that the word of God will take habitation in that heart and will grow. What about you? Do you have a soft heart? Let me give you an example of a soft heart in the word of God, in that great book of Acts, chapter 18. You remember a fellow by the name of Apollos? You remember how Apollos is described in Acts 18 and verse 24? Pretty, pretty magnificently, if you ask me. It was a certain Jew named Apollos born in Alexandria. He was an eloquent man. He was mighty in the scriptures and had come to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, according to verse 25, and being fervent in spirit. There's another thing to appreciate about Apollos. He spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. Now let's stop there just for a moment. I want you to put yourself in the shoes of both parties here. What if you were Apollos? 
You were an eloquent man. You were an eloquent speaker. People looked up at you for your speaking abilities and, and the knowledge that you possessed. And, and they listened to you with reverence uh, and respect. And then here comes these two individuals over here to try to dare and correct me. Can you see some people acting that way? I, I probably can. Maybe, maybe me sometimes. What about Aquila and Priscilla? Maybe in, your, in their shoes you might say uh, they could have raked him over the coals publicly. I think some of your versions will indicate that they, they took him aside privately and taught him the way of God more perfectly as you read there in verse number 27. I would suggest we all need to be like Apollos and Aquila and Priscilla, whether we're the one needing to be corrected or the one doing the correcting. This is a great text for that. Now, in verse number 27, when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote exhorting the disciples to receive him, who, when he was come, helped them much when he had believed through grace. That's just one example of what I believe to be a soft, penetratable, changeable heart in the word of God of a man that had a lot of experience in teaching God's word. I need to have the same kind of heart for I can be wrong. And when I am wrong and that's pointed out to me, I need to what? I need to change. The same can be said of you. And so we need to have a soft heart. Let's add to the list though. We need to have a truth speaking heart. A truth speaking heart. Let's go to that book of great Psalms. Psalm number 15. Psalm number 15. And a lot of this was touched on class this morning. It was a, a good discussion about our thoughts and about our hearts. I was kind of worried you're going to go down my pathway and have to eradicate this point, but we'll go ahead with it. We need to have a truth speaking heart. Verse number one of Psalm 15, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? These are two questions asking the same thing. Who will dwell with God permanently in heaven? And the answers are in verses 2 through 5. So let's look at verse number 2. He that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaks the truth whereat and speaks the truth in his heart. Now isn't that an interesting concept? He didn't say speak the truth with his mouth or his tongue. He said the one who speaks the truth in his heart. That's the one who will take up permanent dwelling with God. Now how does my heart talk? My mind doesn't open up up here and talk. If you want to know what I think, you're going to have to ask me. I cannot see your heart. You cannot see mine. So how does the heart talk? It talks through my actions. That's how it talks. Not necessarily through my words. As an example, Psalm 14 this one, uh, one psalm earlier. Psalm 14, verse 1. You know this one, don't you? It says the same in Psalm 53. The fool hath said whereat? The fool hath said in his heart. There is no God. Did you know that on this earth there are atheists walking around who have never once from their mouth said there is no God? Because their actions say there is no God. I need to make sure that my heart it's truth speaking. That when people see me or when people see you, that they see God. They see Christ living in us. Much like when Paul said in the book of Galatians 2 and verse number 20, that famous oration by Paul there in verse number 20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. If you highlight things in your Bible, whatever form of Bible you're using, you might highlight the words, but Christ live in me. What he's saying is that through his actions, others can see Christ in his life. And I'll ask you to ask that about yourself. When, when people see you at work or people see you at school, or uh, doing something uh, along the recreational or social lines? Do, do they see Christ in my actions? They ought to be able to do that. They ought to be able to know that I'm a follower of God simply by watching my behavior, not necessarily my words. 
Don't go away from here and say that the words aren't important because they are. But actions are important as well. I must have a truth speaking heart. Don't be as those hypocrites in Matthew 23 who say and, and what? Say and do not. The biggest enemy, by the way, of the Lord's church. If we were in a class setting and I asked, who is the biggest enemy of the Lord's church? Do you know what the answer to that is? The biggest enemy of the Lord's church are hypocritical members of the Lord's church. Not false doctrine teachers from outside sources. Those heard as well, as well. And we can make a big long list of other things. But they have members who come into a building like this, no matter, no matter where it's at, to profess that they are members of the Lord's body. And then Monday through Friday or Saturday, they go out and live like the world does undetermined amounts of damage to the local church. I need to have a truth speaking heart. My actions need to be led by the truth in the word of God. A couple of others in the Psalms again. In Psalm number 51. I would encourage us to think about the fact that we also need to be in possession of a broken and contrite heart. Of a broken and contrite heart. Now Psalm 51 is one of the several Psalms written by David concerning his decision making in 2 Samuel 11 and 12 with David, David and Bathsheba and Nathan the prophet. We all know those stories very well. He says in Psalm 51 and verse number 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou will not despise. The word despise in the Bible means to, to look down upon. God will not look down upon any one of us who have a broken and a contrite heart. What's that? What is a broken and a contrite heart? Now, as you turn your Bibles to the book of Matthew chapter 5, a broken and a contrite heart is one who is sorry about the sinful deeds that have been committed in their life. Not everybody's sorry about their sins, are they? Just take a look around the world. The sin is running rampant, and instead of being sorry for it, they're proud of it. And by the way, that took place in the word of God as well. We'll notice that in a few moments. We often hear Psalm 51 and Psalm 34 as well that mentions a broken and a contrite heart and spirit and funerals. And principally speaking, there are great verses to use at funerals because there are broken hearts in that room. I understand that. But David was not talking about somebody dying in Psalm 51 or Psalm 34. Neither was Jesus, by the way, here in Matthew chapter 5 in verse 4 when he issues what we refer to as the Beatitudes in verse 4. One of them says, Blessed are they the more, for they shall be what? For they shall be comforted. Now, there again, we hear these uh, verses at funerals because there's a lot of mourning going on. And we borrow from that principally. That's, that's fine. But in the context here, Jesus is not talking about anything physical. He's talking about spiritual matters. Blessed are they that mourn over their sinful state. And only in that condition can they be what? Only in that condition can they truly be comforted. You know, I just mentioned to you that in the Bible there was a situation in the book of 1 Corinthians 5 where sin was taking place and instead of being broken up about it and humble and contrite about it, there was some pride associated with it. You remember that situation? Chapter 5 and verse 1. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. I would think that if something like that was going on among the members at the lakeside, there would be something done about that. Wouldn't you think? I wonder what happened in Corinth. Well, the verse 2 answers that. And it says, you are puffed up and have not rather what? You have not rather mourned. You're not sorry about this. Your, your heart's not broken about this. That you have done this deed that might be taken away from among you. I, I think about the prodigal son in the book of Luke 15, 11 through 32, when I think about these things. Here's this young man given his, his inheritance. He goes away, as we all know, and lives a riotous prodigal life. 
He had a lot of friends, no doubt, when he had all the money. But once all the money ran out, all the friends ran out. Do you remember where he ended up? He ended up in a pig pen, pigsty, watching the pigs eat, rubbing his belly, thinking that food looks good. That's when he hit what? That's when he hit rock bottom. That's when he finally realized what he had done to his father at home. And that's when he formulated that plan to, I'm going to go back to my father. I'm going to tell him, no longer worthy to be your son. I'm only worthy to be one of your hired servants. He made that plan, and he followed through with that plan. Sometimes we're the prodigal son. Sometimes I am. Sometimes you are. And when we hit that rock bottom, that's really where the broken and contrite spirit, that mournful spirit over our sinful state enters in. And we're in prime position to go back to God. If I'm not broken up about my sin, if you're not broken up about your sin, there's a serious problem brewing in my life. Yours as well. So we need to have that broken and contrite heart. Now the final thing I want to mention to you and study with you is in 2 Thessalonians 3, in verse 5. In addition to the purposed heart and the pricked heart and untroubled heart, and the soft heart and the truth speaking heart, a broken and contrite heart. Let's finish our list by thinking about the need for a Lord directed heart. For a Lord directed heart. In the book of 2 Thessalonians, chapter 3, and verse number 5, Paul writes these words And the Lord direct your hearts. The Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ. We need to have Lord-directed hearts. Not, this is for me, you can use it for you if you want. I do not need a world-directed heart. I do not need a friends and family-directed heart. I do not need a preacher-directed heart. How many times have you been in a discussion with somebody before and they, they keep saying something like, well, my preacher said this and my preacher said that and, or my pastor said this and, and my reverend said this. And there's been times where I've kind of gotten pointed and said, as kindly as I can, I don't care what your preacher said and you shouldn't care what I say either because the Lord should be directing our hearts through his word. Not conscience-directed hearts. Not self-directed hearts, but Lord-directed hearts. Now, as you turn your Bible to 1 Corinthians 14, have you ever heard of red-letter Christians? Red-letter Christians? You ever met a red-letter Christian? And if you don't, if aren't familiar with that, let me tell you who that is. A red-letter Christian is somebody who believes all the red words in the Word of God, which of course are the words of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. But the black words, they're not as important as the rest of Those aren't really the words of the Lord. It's what they're intimating. Are they, are they, is that true? Is that true? I would think that you would say, no, that's not true. But how do I prove that's not true, biblically speaking? You might have to use this verse one day. I encourage you to tuck it away in case you run into somebody who's like this. 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 37, Paul writes, If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge, confess, that the things that I write, who's I here? I is Paul. The things I write unto you are the commandments of who? Are the commandments of the Lord. That's interesting, isn't it? Paul's the one doing the writing. He's the one putting pen to paper here and writing down these words as he's being divinely guided by the Holy Spirit. But Paul says you ought to consider these words as the words of who? As the words of the Lord. If you want to be directed by the Lord and have a Lord-directed heart, we're going to have to look to the Word of God. And more specifically for us in this day and age, the New Testament. So that in its entirety, it can direct us. I want to finish by reading just a few verses with you from the longest of the 150 Psalms. I'm not going to read all of them in case you're wondering, but that is Psalm number 119. There's 176 verses to Psalm 119, and all 176 verses stand as David's as a testament of David's love for God's word. Read through it. 
and find out the love affair that David had with God's word. Just let me read a sampling of some of these. And as I do, I think for myself as to whether or not I have the same attitude towards the word of God. You can think about this yourself in your life. Verse number six. Then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect unto, here comes an important word, when I have respect unto all thy commandments. Not some, not most, but all thy commandments. What about verse 11? Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. We've heard that one before, haven't we? Did you know that putting some memory work in is effective for not sinning in future? According to David, it is. Verse 72. The law of thy mouth is better unto me than thousands of gold and silver. I don't know how much gold's trading at now. The last time I looked, it was like around $1,600 an ounce. But David says the word of God is much better than thousands of those lines to me. What about you? Probably the best known verse in Psalm 119 is 105. Some of you may have that memorized. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. What about you? Do you have that much respect for the word of God? 136. David says rivers of water, waters run down mine eyes. Why, David? What are you so upset about? Because they keep not thy law. That's pretty impressive, isn't it? Rivers of water, I mourn and weep over the fact that the word of God is not being kept, he says. I wonder if we're ups that upset when the word of God has been disobeyed, misapplied, and mistaught. And finally, verse 161, princes have persecuted me without a cause, but my heart stands in all of thy words. You might highlight that. My heart, not this heart, not this one, this one. My heart stands in all of thy word. What about your heart? Does your heart stand in all of God's word? Is your heart a Lord directed heart from the word of God? Or am I allowing my heart to be directed by some other source in my life? Probably all of us are guilty of that from time to time, aren't we? But we need to have a Lord directed heart. Now I assure you, the word heart, by the way, is used like 833 times, I believe it is, in the word of God. You go find some more hearts because there are other positive hearts to study. There are other negative hearts to study. All explaining my attitude and my way of life and my disposition. It's a great study. I encourage you to go and do more of it. Now as we're set to sing the song that Brother Rick announced a few moments ago, we sing songs like, Is thy heart right with who? Is thy heart right with God? We sing songs like, Give me thy what? Give me thy heart. That's what Christ is asking for from you today, is give me thy heart. If you've never been baptized today, did you know that Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, Acts 2. In verse 38. Did you know that Peter wrote, Baptism doth also now save us, 1 Peter 3 and verse 21. Maybe you are a child of God. Maybe you've gone through that. You went down into the waters of baptism, rose to walk, and newness of life, were on fire for the Lord, but have waned over the years. Maybe now you're involved in things that you know you shouldn't be involved in. You know your heart's not right with God. <coughs> you remember Simon the sorcerer was told in Acts 8 and verse 22. Your heart is not right with God. You remember what he was told to do as a Christian? He was already a Christian, wasn't he? He was told to repent and to pray. The thoughts of thy heart may be forgiven thee. So today, if you are a child of God, but are in need of the prayers or to confess sin, I know the folks here well, that they will pray with you and pray for you and pray to God. To not belittle you or make fun of you, but help you and pray with you to God that your sins may be wiped away. So if you're in need of one of those areas today, let us know as we stand and as we sing.